Welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop, where your host, Brian Hart, Adam El Perhuni. I have been working in the financial industry for over 18 years. I started in New York City and in 2010, expanded my business to Alexandria, Virginia. For over 25 years, I have been gaming and investing in collectibles. I grew up in Georgia and in 2017, moved to Washington, D.C. Investor's Coffee Shop is for people who want to learn more about investing, make better decisions, create new streams of income. In each episode, we will discuss investing in art, wine, collectibles, stocks, bonds, real estate, and anything else that may generate a profit. Join us at Investor's Coffee Shop. Welcome back to Investor's Coffee Shop. Today, we'll be talking all about what it takes to invest in real estate development. This is where if you know what you are doing, you can make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money. Along with me and Adam, we have Wynita back. Just Hello, temporarily. Wynita. Just temporarily. So don't worry, Adam. She's not taking over your job quite yet. No, no, no. And as you remember, Wynita helped us out with the first four or five episodes we did for Investor's Coffee Shop. And then Adam came in and took over her spot. And now she does all the marketing in the background. How's that been for you? It's been good. It's been an experience. I have a lot more respect for people who are in marketing, I have to say. It's a whole different ballgame than what we normally do. Excellent. Well, welcome back. We're glad to have you. Today, we're discussing real estate development with Paul Silverman. Back in 1981, Paul and his brother Eric started a real estate development company, Silverman. Based in Jersey City, New Jersey, they have been in business for over 40 years and counting. They had a vision for abandoned factories, rundown buildings, and they have created over 1,000 residences and over 500,000 square feet of commercial space. Due to their continued success, they have made a number of neighborhoods a better place to live and visit. They currently use philanthropy as a way to give back to their local communities. Paul, welcome to Investor's Coffee Shop. What was the reason you and your brother chose real estate development? Well, thank you, and I'm looking forward to sharing it. Uh, back in 1978, when I got out of college, I took over my father's trucking company in Kearney, not too far from Jersey City. Two years later, I invited my brother, who graduated from college, to join me in the trucking company. He, he said, no, thanks. I want to build buildings. And I don't know if, if real estate developing was, was a popular word back then, but he found Jersey City, found an old rundown building that was sorely in need of redevelopment. It was a 14-unit empty apartment building with a commercial storefront. And Eric was able to track down the owners of it, uh, asked to uh, buy the building from them. They didn't want to sell, but he, he made them an offer that they accepted. He came to me and asked me to lend him the money, offered to invest with him instead. I said, I'll be your investor. I'll put the money up. You do the hard work for restoring the building. And within a year, we did this, Eric did this beautiful restoration on the building. Three weekends, my wife, Eric, and myself showed the 14 apartments and rented all 14 of them. Got a good cash flow out of that and then refinanced the building. And that's been our model to take old rundown buildings and fix them up. One more thing about that. While I was running my trucking company, probably 80% of the time, 10, 20% of the time for the real estate. In the mid-90s, my real estate, uh, I'm sorry, my trucking company really suffered. I ended up closing it by... 1998, uh, Eric and I were both full-time real estate. We've been doing that ever since. So you really give your credit to your brother, Eric, for putting you into this business then? Yes, absolutely. And Eric is really the creative side of our team. He's a dreamer and creative. He can look at a building or empty land and he's got that vision. And then I've got the patience to help manage it after Eric builds it. So Eric designs and builds our buildings and then I manage them. I, I love the details. I love interfacing with people. And as uh, Eric and I say often, Eric is a chef and I'm the maitre d'. Uh, the funny thing is, too, Eric sometimes prefers people to not move into the buildings because they start hanging up pictures and stuff in the floor and all that. And I'm the one hanging the pictures for people, helping them out. So it's a good partnership. And, and I do credit Eric with that vision and his creativity to be able to build these beautiful buildings. You mentioned commercial buildings. Is that your primary business model? Do you work in other uh, industries like the residential or even kind of the industrial side of things? So we do have uh, some industrial buildings. You know, I mentioned I was running our father's truck company back in the late 70s, early 80s. So we still have that warehouse. We rented out a moving and storage company and a Turkish food importer. Uh, we rent a couple of buildings to Verizon. So we do have some industrial. And, and then on the residential side, we have mixed use buildings where we'll have commercial space on a ground floor, maybe office space on a second or third floor, and then apartments upstairs. And the ground floor commercial space can be restaurants, schools, 
dry cleaner, pharmacy, a vintage clothing store. Even the gym? The gym, yeah, that's where you and I met, Juanita. Two beautiful gyms that rent from us. So we really try to create great uh, commercial spaces with enthusiastic entrepreneurs that, that have beautiful, beautiful stores and, and restaurants and places to shop and to be. There's a great story on how Paul and I met. I It was like two o'clock in the afternoon and I was going to the gym and he was there with his assistant at the time trying to, I believe, give over the mannership to, of the gym. And he was like, do you know anybody who want a gym? And I was like, no, I don't want to know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he was very hands-on throughout the entire process. And I believe you were able to find someone to take over the mannership. Yes. That, yeah, we got a great person. You know, Eric and I keep your ears to the ground and try to meet a lot of people in the area. And we met uh, Marcisco Morrison. He owned a, own, still currently owns a small gym a few miles away from our building. And I met with him and got some great references about him. And we made a deal for him to take over the gym from us. And just go back one step. The first gym operator was there for 10 years. And during the pandemic, she just couldn't succeed. And she tried and tried and tried. And, and we like to keep it open as an amenity. So uh, we, we bought the asset from her, uh, operated ourselves for almost a year now. And then we're able to find Marcisco to come take it over. And he started just a few weeks ago. And, and already, you know, the response has been great. Loves physical fitness. His company is called Four Fitness. That's what you are. Talking about the four major muscle types in your bodies. He's been a, a great find for our neighborhood. You mentioned these main types that you and your brother invest in. Do you, as an investor, have a preference? Does your brother have a preference? Is there anything that you look for out of the types of investing for real estate that you prefer? Yes, uh, we look for a mixed use. And rather than put all our eggs in one basket, we've got a really good mix of uh, rental apartments. We've built some condominium apartments along the way. And then our retail spaces have different types of restaurants from Vietnamese to Italian to Cuban. Australian, so you know, good mix of restaurant types. We've got uh, three different schools that run from us: a Montessori school, a Scandinavian nursery school, and then a really creative preschool, garden preschool, with only 18 families as cooperatives. So again, trying to be diverse in our investment, so that you know, we really share the risk of failure. So that if one type of business is no longer financially good, we've got 99 others. So you know, really try to keep it diverse. Would you, for first-time real estate investors, do you recommend mixed use or is there an easier or better route to start when they get involved? Start out on a small scale. As we did, uh, the first building was a 14-unit apartment building, empty for a long time. And we took the risk to buy that building, fix it up. It now is a beautiful neighborhood. 40 years ago, it was scary. You, you didn't want to be in there at night. There were no trees. There was litter in the streets, broken windows. And so, you know, in addition to fixing up our building, we also planted trees along the street, made sure the sidewalk was spotless at all times. And from there, from those sidewalks, you could see the Statue of Liberty. You could see Manhattan. You could walk five minutes to the PATH train and be in New York City. It had great potential. But starting out, you're going to be able to buy you know, a four-unit building, a 10-unit building in a marginal neighborhood. You can't buy it in the best neighborhood. You won't be able to afford it. So you buy it in that fringe neighborhood and then work with the neighbors to make it beautiful and clean and neat and welcoming, and you can be successful. How did you like get the funding when you first started? Did you ask family or did you partner with like experienced uh, investors before or like experienced developers? Hey, good question. Our first investment, we put up, we had our own money, actually my money for the, the purchase of the building. And then we needed to borrow money to redevelop the building. So we walked around the corner to a Provident Bank. Their headquarters was just a block away from our first project. So we walked in there and asked them if they could lend us $400,000 to rehab this old building. And they said, oh, absolutely. Have you done any projects before? They said, no, this is our very first project ever. And they hesitated and they said, okay, but do you have any collateral? No, no, we've used all our money to buy the building. Uh, are you willing to have your father co-sign the loan to guarantee it? And we said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to be on our own. And they rejected the loan, rejected our, our application and said, no, we're not going to lend to you. We went to, from bank to bank to bank. Nobody wanted to lend to us, no guarantees. So we changed our tune after about 10 rejections. We started calling bank presidents. And I connected with this one bank president almost adopted us as grandson and he brought us into his office and he set up a meeting with his vice president of the real estate division in their bank and they approved the loan and so as a matter of making that connection over the phone 
enough for the bank president to invite me in to meet us in person. We, we wore suits and ties and tried to look as old and mature. And that bank took, took a shot on us. So a couple lessons there. You know, one is don't give up. Keep knocking on doors until somebody answers. And we kept knocking on bank doors and you know, calling and, and finally found a banker that would take us and then make that relationship happen. Speaking of building, so what characteristics do you look for when you decide on a property that you might think it's a good idea to develop? First of all, access to transportation. I think that's really important. Uh, Jersey City has a, a train system called the PATH, and it's a few minutes into Manhattan, a few minutes into Newark. So we, we like to be walkable to the train. Uh, I think that's really helpful. So we, we look for transportation is probably one of the first things. And then we also ch- try to choose a neighborhood that needs to be rebuilt. If you uh, go to the fanciest, nicest neighborhood, it's going to be too expensive to buy something. And then convert the neighborhood into a great neighborhood. And that's actually our, our company tagline is building neighborhoods. So we're really looking for something that is near transportation that that we can improve and add value to. Does it take a long time to get the permits for those kind of builds? No, it sure does. I mean, we've, you know, after 40 years, we've developed a a great reputation in Georgia City where probably probably easier for us than most, but still, you know, planning boards and zoning boards and councils and building departments, there's so many approvals along the way. We just completed a building in Georgia City called the Hendricks, the high-rise apartment building. I love that building. The design is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. I, I give Eric full credit for that design, working with all the architects and designers. It helped steer it to be a beautiful building. But that building's 41 years in the making. 1982, we bought the first lot on that block. And over time, put enough lots together to make it big enough to build a, a building on it. And we just completed the building this past year. Starting this process 40 years ago, what, what what was the trigger that said we need to hold on to this and start expanding? Or what was the investment opportunity there that you and your brother saw that made it worth starting that process? That block there had a lot of empty lots on it, some rundown homes, and three blocks away from the train station. Uh, it becomes a, a prime potential for, for redevelopment and improvement. Patiently you know, negotiating and buying and and uh, getting the city to support our efforts. Remember, uh, we bought that first one in 1982. Didn't break ground until 2000. And uh, we did have some temporary parking on it. What was like the typical cost for something like that then? 40 years ago, I don't remember what we paid for. I don't remember those original costs. But I do have to say that building, the design and everything is absolutely beautiful. Did Eric design it or did you? Was it a team effort? Yes, a big team effort. Uh, Marchetto Higgins C architect, now known as MHS Architects are the, uh, the main architects for the exterior of the building and the, the design of the building. But we had big team meetings with probably 30 people in the room, including architects, engineers, designers, marketing people, and then the principals, my brother and me and our, our partners in the project, sitting around a big table, we show different designs, and the architect would say, let me make it this color, let me make it this shape, let me make it this size. What do people think? But I really credit Eric with leading a lot of that. What about kind of existing properties you started working on that didn't come out as planned or may be considered what you would call like a a bad investment in the end? I can tell you our 40 years of business, we also had a big failure in the uh, late 80s. 1987, the stock market crashed. In 1988, the real estate market crashed. 1990, one of our banks went out of business. And when that happens, the federal government takes over the bank and tells anyone that owes money to the bank, you have to give it back. So we didn't have any money to give back. And between 1990 and 1994, we had to do workout with almost every one of our banks, try to negotiate, settle whatever we could do. You know, we, we owed so much money. Everything was so highly leveraged. Meaning we had borrowed a lot of money to build what we had. With times getting bad, our tenants weren't paying rent. Almost everything between 1990 and 94. We worked out deals with all of our banks and all of our vendors and settled everything amicably. We owed you $100, give you $30 in cash, we'd give you some other assets, something, and settle for that $100 we owed you. But, you know, we were talking millions of dollars at that time. So uh, end of 1994, we were able to settle every last loan that we had, and we ended up not owing anybody any money. felt really good to do that, but we also didn't have any money left. And we had just a few assets left. Big break in 1998. One of the bankers that called that was working out with us went to a new bank 
uh, a bank named Joe Burkhart. He was at Sovereign Bank now, and, and he said, uh, I'm at this new bank. We'd like to lend you some money. I said, Joe, you know, what are you, nuts? I said, we didn't pay you back in full the last time when you were at the other bank. And he said something that, that really helped us in our 30s to understand uh, business. He said, uh, no one paid us back in full, but you and Eric returned every phone call I made to you, lived up to every promise that you made. You have the kind of character you want to lend to. Things fail and things go bad. Keep answering the phone. Keep your, your lines of communication open with your bankers so they know where you're at. Don't hide anything, you know, and, and really be forthright. And, you know, be careful of what you promise. And, you know, that's a great business lesson all the time. Be careful about what you promise because you have to fulfill your promises. Really, really critical. If you're promising to pay that $30, you know, remember, we owed you 100 I promise you 30 you got to deliver that $30 to show your character. So uh, the Sovereign let this money to buy and rehab the Park Foundry building, beautiful brass foundry here in Jersey City. And uh, within a year, we did an amazing restoration of it, filled it up, 32 apartments right away, five commercial spaces downstairs. I got permanent financing, paid back Sovereign Bank quickly before they even expected it and let this money for the next one. And now with uh, M&T Bank and with and Provident Bank, we're back to Provident Bank after they turned us down in 1981. Uh, Provident Bank's become one of our biggest banks. So between Provident, M&T, the Investors Bank, which is now Citizen, we've been able to, to grow responsibly, answer our phones when it rings, stick to our promises when we make our promises. So a lot of, a lot of lessons along the way. You know, you mentioned the stock market crash in the late 80s. I assume the Great Recession probably had a similar effect. In what ways has the stock market affected you uh, in both negative but also in the positive? Positive, you know, when the stock market is up, people are willing to spend more money, that's for sure. But uh, we were really lucky in uh, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. We had just purchased St. Francis Hospital as the hospital complex in Jersey City to convert it to mixed use and an adaptive reuse with the residential and restaurants and schools. So we we're in the process of rebuilding it during that time. We had already gotten our bank financing, just uh, signed off on it a month before the uh, big crash in 2008, in October. And then the construction workers came to work every single day because everybody was afraid of losing their jobs, continuous construction going on, and not selling or renting any of it until end of 2009 as we started coming out of that recession. So that worked out really well for us. We had a great investor with uh, Goldman Sachs. They were our equity investor in that project. They're terrific partners, helped us through. And, and uh, being a, a strong uh, player in the financial market, Goldman Sachs was able to really help our, convince our bank to continue to lend to us each month. And let me just talk about Goldman Sachs for a moment, if I could. We met them because uh, when we had settled all our debt, the city hired us to build some senior housing, helping Goldman Sachs fulfill their commitment to building some affordable housing in uh, Jersey City. Between Goldman Sachs making a commitment to the city and then the city uh, hiring us to build this affordable housing, we got to know the people at Goldman Sachs, their urban investment group. So because of that relationship, building the affordable housing with Jersey City, Goldman Sachs asked if they, if they could help us with any other projects. And so they helped us buy that hospital complex we talked about, developing a relationship, working with uh, Goldman Sachs, a huge able to, to get their involvement because of that relationship and the trust that they had in what we did. Do you think you work more now than when you were younger, or is it still the same? That's a good question. Uh, I, I say my hours are the same. You know, I, I work full-time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, always thinking about work. I do have the ability to travel more now. I think over the last five to 10 years, I've been hiring more people to do more of what I was doing. I think that's a fair way to say it, that you know, I'm, 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 both my brother and I are, are, have a little more freedom to be out of the office. As the company matures, it gives you that ability to hire some additional people. We have a great director of property management who oversees the, the actual uh, management of the apartments. We've got a terrific controller overseeing our bookkeepers and all the financial, legal. And we've got an amazing director of leasing and sales who oversees making sure the apartments stay full. And in addition to renting apartments, we're also licensed real estate brokers. So we help our renters when they buy, which is really the biggest compliment we get. You know, someone moves into Jersey City, 
renting apartments from us for years and have loved it so much that they'll spend uh, seven, eight hundred thousand, a million and a half dollars to uh, to buy something in the neighborhood. So uh, we help them with that as well. So yeah, so I, I am able to take a little more time off. Um, you know, I am in my sixties now, so it's nice to be able to enjoy the the forty years of investing. Being a developer competitive now, or is it still the same as like back in the nineties? Yeah, it's, it's very competitive, risky. You know, you could build an amazing building and never fill it up and end up not making any money on it, maybe losing it to the bank if you can't fill it up. Uh, it's hard work. It's all consuming, but hugely rewarding. You know, when you can take it, transform an empty rundown building or an empty lot or a, uh, a broken down building and make it into something beautiful that people like to live there and work there and eat there and raise families or, or be with their grandchildren. It's so rewarding. You build a building, if you keep it rented and keep it well maintained, you know, it, it gives you income for life. But you have to be good at it. You have to provide good service. Now, one other thing, you know, our, our father, although he wasn't in the real estate business, he taught us about quality, about buying quality and building quality so that you don't have those headaches. If we have a, a building to build, and rather than put in the $200 cheap water heater, we'll put in the $500 good water heater so that for 10 years, there's no leaks in the building, you know, good solid doors. And, and uh, I sit at my father's desk in, in my real estate office, but it was the desk that my father bought in 1969 for his trucking company. And he definitely spent more than he should have, but he bought really good quality. It's a solid wood desk, with beautiful chrome trim that works as well. And the drawers open and close as well as it did 51 years ago, 52 years ago. Build quality, give good service, keep the buildings full. And you'll maintain that value for life. Paul, I'm noticing a theme here, uh, quality relationships with bank. So it sounds like to invest in real estate, uh, especially commercial real estate, it's more than just having a lot of money and just going into it. What would you say are the kind of the key things you need for someone to start off investing in real estate to be successful? First, you have to find a product building, a, a site, very time consuming, and it requires a lot of, lot of time to, to look and find and discover the, uh, the site to be developed, find a good place, and then to look for a good partner. You know, if, you're, if you happen to be lucky and have a lot of money, uh, great, you can do your own money, but that's rare. You normally need a bank or some investor to go with you. So, What about regulations and regulators? I assume knowing a lot about that probably helps, especially depending on your city and state. Yes, we've decided to keep it local. And, you know, we, we're primarily in Jersey City. So we know the building department, the zoning department, the planning board, and, and we've developed a reputation here. So it's been a little easier as time goes on where they can trust our judgment, trust our presentations, and trust our promises. If you, if you get too thin and, you know, a bunch of different cities, you got to learn all the different ways they operate. I recommend trying to concentrate in one area and, uh, and get to be develop a good reputation, get to know how to navigate and, and not give up, you know, be persistent about it. So I read an article from CNBC how someone bought a school and they renovated it into an apartment. And I've noticed that the trend now is like turning an office space into a living space or doing something as extreme as like buying a school and renovating it. How is that done exactly? We've done quite a few like that, uh, an old vaudeville theater, old luggage factory, carpet store, hospital, brass foundry. Uh, the hospital project, good example, busy hospital in Hamilton Park, beautiful neighborhood of Jersey City. Hospital was very busy, but losing a lot of money. And the nuns that owned it also owned a hospital in Hoboken. So the hospital president called my brother and me in for a secret meeting. The hospital is not for sale, but if it ever would be. How much would you pay for our buildings? And when we became a, a rough guess of what we thought those buildings were worth, within a year, they shut down the hospital, sold us the buildings, and we were able to, over these last 17 years, rehabilitate. And uh, we had divided up the project into four phases and just finished the fourth and final phase now. But there, you know, you're you just completely transforming the neighborhood. Instead of a, a rundown hospital that uh, noisy all hours of the night with ambulances coming and going, and we now have a beautiful complex of restaurants and stores and schools and you know all the services that people need to live there and but it's patients taking time and, and also having the hospital know of us through our reputation in Jersey City to invite us in to uh, consult about the building and stress that enough for 
young people getting into the business, you know, make your promises, stick to your promises, develop that good reputation of ethically proper decisions and philanthropic. Has everyone ever, ever bought crypto with one of your properties? <laughs> I don't know. I've not used any crypto money. It's all been traditional uh, financing with banks. Have you ever like walked away from a project when you're like, this is not going as envisioned or not working out as you thought? You were just like, I can't put in any more time and money into it. You just decided to walk away from it? Not on a big scale, but on a small scale, we've had negotiations with prospective tenants that we've walked away from. Uh, either couldn't come to terms with us or they wouldn't live up to obligations. Uh, we had one, we had a we were going to invest $100,000 in his, into his business. We were holding some note until he paid the $100,000. We kept that note. And then he said to me, well, if I pay you 99000 you shouldn't hold the note. Said, no, you have to pay the whole 100000 You know, he didn't understand that. He had to pay the whole money back. So we stopped working with him and we did not end up renting to him. You know, we need people that understand if you make a promise, you got to live up to that promise. And sometimes we get dragged out a few commercial tenants that we meet with and the meetings go on and on and on and on and on and never sign a lease. And, but we've made so many good leases along the way that it's, it's rare to walk away from something. You know, early on, after the first meeting, you get a, a sense of if it's going to happen or not. Did you always have a good team behind you when you were growing your business? We had no team. It was Eric and me in the beginning. When I was running the trucking company, I had a team of people in the trucking company. But real estate was really just Eric and me in the beginning. And then when I closed my trucking company and went full-time real estate, we had one employee, you know, an office manager, helped us uh, with paperwork in the office. So we've grown over time and a bookkeeper and then another bookkeeper and then a controller and overseeing the bookkeepers, a property manager and then a, a maintenance manager and then a director of property management. So, you know, we have grown over time as we could afford it. So it's really important to, to hire the people that you can afford to pay. Uh, nothing crazy like some of these startup companies might do. It's a nice slow growth adding people over these years. You know, we have about 40 employees. It's big enough that you know we've got people to, to cover things when I'm out of the office, but small enough that you know we're hands-on. And I still get to call people when they move into their apartments. And I thank them for being here. Or I see them in person and shake their hand and welcome them. So it's a, it's a nice size. Going back to... Looking at finding properties, you know, when people buying homes, they have to look at a lot of factors. You know, are they in a flood zone? Is this uh, kind of the topography or the geography is a little different? What uh, what does it? How does that affect your search in the commercial realm? So sure, you mentioned flood zone. I mean, that's really important, especially with global warming, a little bit more storms and flooding. And Jersey City, Hoboken, both have areas that are flood prone. So that's certainly something to be careful of. But then also you're looking for opportunity to add value to the building, uh, whether it be run down, broken down, no trees, uh, no shopping uh, to building that could add. You could add a few stories to it or something. Anywhere we can add value to that existing building, that's where you're going to have the biggest opportunity. Also the biggest risk, but you know, with risk comes reward. The other thing I want to say about that is a lot of the real estate doesn't pay you off quickly. You know, you'll, you'll get good steady income along the way. But if you hold on to it long enough, in 10 years of, of owning a property, you can refinance it. And that's really the, the best thing. At that point, your debt is down a little bit. The value should be higher. And you can refinance either with the same bank or finance or with somebody new, really pull some money out of that property that you can use for the next one. We've done that along the way. You know, we make sure we manage the building well, keep it well maintained so that after 10 years, the, the value is much higher and the debt is lower. And so you've got that equity you've developed in there. Yeah, that makes sense. And when you are looking at properties, when at what point do you know, and maybe it's at the very beginning, that you're going to either knock down a building to rebuild something there or gut it and just do a kind of a rehabilitation of it? Yes, yeah, that does happen early on. We try never to knock down buildings. We try to work with what we have. With the hospital complex, we talked about the St. Francis Hospital. There were seven buildings, and we kept six of them, and I did tear down one because it really wasn't suited for rehabilitation. But we try to respect that history, be good for the environment, too, rather than demolition and all that waste of, of a beautiful foundation that was there. We try to reuse it wherever we can. It's fun to do that. It, it takes a lot of creativity to do that. It's more expensive to do it that way. There's more headaches involved, certainly more rewarding. Brings up a good question. What is the cost difference between a teardown and a rehab, uh, you know, on average or just estimated? 
Yes, it is more expensive to rehab because you have to work within those parameters, design it the right way. To give an example, you know, the plans call for a water pipe to go in a certain place. And then as you're uh, doing that, you realize there's a column uh, holding up that building that's in that where that pipe's supposed to be. So now you've got to rework it and there's an extra from the plumbing contractor because we didn't uh, anticipate that when you open up that wall, there's going to be a column in that wall there. So you have new construction starting out with a clean slate. You build a building that nothing gets in your way. Very little gets in your way. It is uh, more costly, a little more headache, a little more complex to rehab an old building, but we find it so much more rewarding when, when you can do it that way. Speaking of headaches, with rising interest rates right now, how is that affecting you? Yeah, it's certainly it's making our borrowing more expensive. Uh, no question. But, you know, the rates are still relatively low. Being in business all these years, we can remember 10% rates, 15% rates, late 70s, early 80s. So today's rates are, are, although they're so much higher than they were a year ago, it's still relatively low and just have to be a little sharp with uh, watching your costs. Thinking about that and kind of going back to your history, what would you say, you know, to an investor? And you've mentioned a lot of good points here, so I just want to make sure it's clear for the audience too, is to be the next Paul and Eric, and what steps should they take to kind of reach where you all are? I appreciate you using that as a goal. Yeah, it's going to be finding a great property, looking for a partner and you know, not giving up, looking for that partner. And when I mean partner, it could be a bank, could be a finance company, could be a, another Goldman Sachs that work hard to find that. And then build a beautiful building, include the neighborhood when you're designing it as well. When we built our building, Charles & Co. next to City Hall, it had been an empty lot for a long, long time. So we had 40 neighborhood meetings to show the neighborhood what we wanted to build there and got their input. People were, were uh, requesting certain things and we moved the driveway from one side of the building to the other. We put a wrought iron fence to match the street. You know, did a lot of things requested for the neighbors so that they embraced us instead of protested. Instead of protesting against us, they supported us. And Big Success is one of the biggest opponents to the project. Lived a uh, right behind our, our building. I toured him through it when we were complete. And he said, Paul, you and Eric have really knocked it out of the park with this building. And I think that it's a huge compliment because this man was the biggest complainer about what we were going to build there. And when he saw the final product, he loved it. And we've improved the value of his home. And uh, one other example for you on uh, Park Francis building on Erie Street. We made a mess of the street while we were doing construction. And they we took the parking from them. We we made a noise. We made a mess. When we finished the project, we met the five home. We met with the five homeowners across the street. We asked them how we could thank them, and we ended up putting a new sidewalk in for their whole block. You know, a little thing like that. You know, it's expensive, but they they were so appreciative. Being in the industry for so long, I'm I'm sure you guys have made a lot of mistakes along the way, trial and error. I was just wondering, what mistakes have you made that we can learn from, or try to avoid if we want to get into this. Yeah, I got uh, good uh, personal and business mistakes I made along the way. Uh, one of them was being greedy, natural tendency to think something's worth than, more than it is. Selling my first apartment, I, apartment that I lived in right after college, I was selling it for uh, a lot more than I bought it for. Give us some numbers from 1980s. I bought it for $93,000, beautiful one bedroom condo. When I was selling it four years later, there's nothing like it in the neighborhood. I put a price on it of $150,000, huge markup over my $93,000. The first night it was on the market, a young guy came in and offered me $135,000 for this apartment. And I said no, because I wanted my $150,000. Six months later, I sold it for $135,000. So I was being greedy. You know, I should have looked at it and said, wow, $135,000. I could make $35,000. I'm, I'm selling this place after living here for four years. I should have grabbed it, you know, gone back at 136,000, 137, something. But I, I said, oh, I'm going to be uh, getting so much more. So a little bit greedy. And then it happened to us on a big scale. You know, we had bought a building worth a lot of money. Someone offered us a lot more money right after we bought it. We thought it'd be worth even more. And I'm being a little cagey about the dollar amounts. But, uh, you know, they gave us a really good offer. We said no. And we ended up losing that building. The bank foreclosed on us. You know, if we had not been so, I don't know, greedy is a negative word, but you know, we, we were being unrealistic with the value. If you're selling something, you get a reasonably good offer, work to make it happen, make the sale happen. Don't be greedy. Other mistakes along the way, uh, we quit before we, we gave it enough effort. 
I talked before about knocking on the doors until they answer. There have been times where we've stopped two or three tries and, and just stopped. And we should have kept going. Shouldn't have given up so early. That's helped us be more and more persistent and persevere and never give up. A good opportunity if you keep going, you know, that, that you will make it happen. So there have been times where we've stopped and given up. Hiring the wrong people, that's another big thing. You know, we haven't talked a lot about people. We've talked a lot about buildings here. But getting the right staff, the right team together is such an important part of it. We've made some bad hirings along the way and, and realized it. And, and I think we just got to be so smart about hiring. And uh, we've been, been really fortunate to have put together this amazing team now. And, and so we're, we're lucky that way. But uh, do you have a kind of a white whale property there, one that you or Eric have been trying to hunt down for so long and haven't been able to get yet? No, I, have, I feel really satisfied. I, you know, we have such a, an interesting variety of projects we've worked on, whether it be new construction or renovation, condominium, rental, retail, restaurant. I feel like we, we've really satisfied. But then the other thing we haven't done, we, we don't have any hotels. It's probably the only thing we're missing, but I'm really happy and satisfied with the, the mix that we have. Uh, the retailers, you know, when you come walk the streets of Jersey City, you'll see these amazing stores and retail that we've helped put in, in business. There's not one special thing I'm looking for at this age. So I'm, I'm happy. Well, that's great. You, you didn't want to buy City Hall one day or anything like that then? Oh, well, when it becomes for sale, I'd definitely buy it. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think City Hall, I, I mean, the building of City Hall, I think will always be a City Hall. I can see post post office buildings, uh, less and less use at the you know, United States Postal Service. I can see those over the years being developed. There's some really grand post office buildings. You know, uh, New York City, the Penn Station, you know, in the old uh, post office building there. And I can see more and more of that. I think uh, some of these classic post office buildings eventually go on the market. And uh, maybe not for me, but, you know, the future developers be able to pick those up. And, and there, too, it'll be developing a relationship with uh, the federal government offices uh, that, that sell those buildings. And you want to get that reputation where they call you first and say, hey, I've got this post office going on the market. You want to be able to do that. We were able to do that with Verizon. Our father's first warehouse is rented to Verizon. And we developed a relationship with their real estate team and picked us to develop the second building. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of that reputation and, and relationship we talked about earlier. You know, the market's changed so much since both you and Eric got involved in it. What, uh, what tools or research options do you use and what do you recommend for people that they can check out, uh, you know, today to help them in their investing and uh, search? Well, certainly, you know, Google Maps makes it easy now. You know, we do keep things local, but it's too easy to look at a property now. You can walk the neighborhood using Google Maps. We didn't have that before. But, you know, with tax searches now online and uh, tax records, it's something as simple as Google, you know, learning the history of a building. But, you know, there's a lot of financial tools. We use uh, Appfolio. That's our software that we use now. And uh, that's been helpful having one software package that really encompasses all the things we do. And there's, uh, there's a few other companies like that now that, you know, Big software companies that have thousands of customers that really enable us to, to manage our, our real estate with maintenance requests and with the initial inquiry into the, the property with applications and then collecting the money and then keeping the books and paying the bills and you know, all the steps along the way to, to manage uh, an apartment building, manage a fixed use building. So it's really been helpful having that, the new software. I'd like to thank Paul Silverman for speaking with us today. And if you have any questions that we did not get to, please list them in the comments section, or you can email us at investorscoffeeshop at gmail.com. You can also contact and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, like, and leave us a review. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We will see you next time at Investors Coffee Shop.